The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well-being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Quadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, I am very excited today. We're going to be talking about Aducanumab or Aduhelm with two <laughs> national experts on the subject. Who do we have with us today, Alex? Just to be clear, Eric's been talking about Aducanumab on every single podcast we've re- <laughs> we recorded since it was approved. We're delighted to welcome today Aaron Kesselheim, who is an internist, who is a professor at Harvard Medical School, who is a lawyer, who runs a program on uh, the intersection of law and regulation for clinical therapeutics. He was also on the FDA advisory committee that uh, recommended against approval of aducanumab and then resigned six weeks ago and says he hasn't heard the end of it since then. Welcome to the Jerry Powell podcast, Aaron. Thank you both. It is a uh, it is a pleasure to be here and to talk about these issues. And we're delighted to welcome back Jason Karlowish, who is a physician and writer. We had him on our podcast about his a uh, book on the history and the of uh, of Alzheimer's disease. He's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and is co-director of the Penn Memory Center and is a self-described reluctant prescriber of aducanumab. Welcome to the Jerry. Welcome back to the Jerry Pell podcast, Jason. It's- Great to be back, Alex and Eric. Sorry it had to be under these circumstances. Well, we'll we'll have a link to our past podcast with Jason and to his book on the show notes. Um, and we also did a podcast with Gil Rabinovich on yeah. amyloid PET scans and aducanumab. Um, so we're going to dive into aducanumab in full today. But before we do, Aaron, do you have a song request for Alex? I do as an homage to where I grew up in New Jersey. And it turns out where Jason also grew up uh, in New Jersey. Jason, I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Where are you from? Oh, wow. I'm a little more north. Ramsey, New Jersey, Bergen County, a little more north on the Garden State Parkway. All right. Well, uh, so somewhere in between us uh, was uh, where Bruce Springsteen is from. And so we're requesting uh, Born to Run. All right. Great choice. I love I love the boss. Uh, I slowed this down and I don't have a full band, so this is my acoustic version. In the day we sweated out on the streets of a runaway American dream. At night we ride through the mansions of glory in suicide machines. Sprung from cages on Highway 9, chrome wheeled, fuel injected, and stepping out over the line. Whoa, baby, this town rips the bones from your back It's a death trap, it's a suicide rap We gotta get out while we're young Cause tramps like us, maybe we were born to run Excellent job. Have you guys been to a concert by Bruce? I heard they're amazing. A lot, for sure. Yeah, you, you oh, kind of yeah, have to great. as a New Jerseyan, right? That's right. I mean, I saw him like three years ago. He was still stage diving. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> Successful <laughs> aging. <laughs> hey, Eric, did we mention that we're now sponsored by Biogen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're probably the last of, of, of their efforts to throw some coin around to try and right. pump this business model. Uh, well, let's dive into this topic. Uh, let's kind of think about it broad. Let, I'm going to assume some of our listeners have not even heard of aducanumab or aduhelm. Um, Jason, what the heck is it and why should we care? Aducanumab is a drug manufactured to use the uh, an antibody to target amyloid in the brain of a human. The theory is that if you can remove uh, amyloid, particularly uh, oligomers, seems to be the target that that drug particularly seemed to target, uh, that that would um, uh, affect one of the underlying pathologies that's well associated with Alzheimer's disease dementia, namely elevated amyloid, the presence of uh, amyloid plaques, along with, of course, tangles of tau protein. It's one of a number of therapies of a similar uh, 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 model um, that's been tested in humans. And this particular drug uh, made it all the way to phase three, two identical phase three studies engage and emerge, uh, which were halted on a futility analysis. Uh, data, More data came in, more analyses were done. One study popped out to have a p- effect on drug greater than placebo. The other did not. 
The rest is history, namely, uh, the companies decided to still pursue an application to FDA. Uh, we'll talk more, but it seems like FDA was as encouraging as the company was, uh, uh, if not even more. And uh, a review occurred in November of last year that Aaron was present at, I witnessed, uh, which resulted in a decision that was nearly unanimous to say the drug was not safe and effective based on standard approval regulations to decide. Uh, time passed. And on June 7th, the FDA issued a decision that said that the drug will be approved, but they used a different set of regulations that had not been discussed prior, uh, the accelerated approval regulations. And here we are today with the drug available. There's more to say, um, obviously, about those events, but that's the drug. So aducanumab uh, was transformed in a, in a rather dark baptism, I think, from aducanumab into aduhelm for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, Jason, let's talk about some of the clinical data too. Aaron, jump on in. Aducanumab or Aduhelm is really good at taking, like, is this a, a question all, uh, at all about whether, how good is it at treating, I think what Gil Rabinovich said uh, is Mousheimer's. Being able to take away um, amyloid packs from the brain, does it do a really good job of that? Oh, we've been treating mice successfully with anti-amyloid therapeutics since the turn of the century. Uh, in fact, that was the breakthrough study that even uh, in mice that even made the national news. It was so provocative. Since then, these drugs in the class have been pretty good at removing amyloid. In fact, with, with respect to aducanumab, the 2016 front cover of Nature depicted a uh, brain with and without amyloid. And the story was aducanumab's ability in an early phase study to remove amyloid. So that's been well described for this particular drug for at least four or five years. No surprise there. We knew that. The question was the degree to which this removal of amyloid translated into improvements in or stabilization in the health and well-being of our patient's brain. And I think there, I'm of the view that more study is, was, still is needed of this drug. In simply put, this drug is not ready for to be given to patients with a prescription, but to be given to subjects based having reviewed an informed consent form. I still think the drug needs more study. Uh, I'm of the view that there may be something here uh, we can talk more what that may be and why, um, but but the removal of amyloid was not a surprise. We knew that for five years. The issue was the degree that that translates into benefit for patients, and that I think is still in equipoise. And and if I could take you back to the glory days of uh, November 2020, which is when yeah. we had the which is when we had the the advisory committee meeting. The, the, the discussion at the advisory committee was not about the, uh, the amyloid and the uh, aducanumab's effect on amyloid. In fact, they, the FDA told the advisory committee that there wasn't a debate over what other, whether or not uh, uh, aducanumab uh, reduced amyloid. And, and I think the advisory committee had actually voted that that was the case. But the whole discussion at the advisory committee was about the effect of aducanumab on cognitive function. And what the advisory committee help found nearly unanimously was that there was no convincing evidence that it had any effect on cognitive function. And then, you know, six months later, uh, the FDA approves the drug based on the effect on amyloid. It kind of switches the right. entire premise on which the, um, on which the, the, the approval was made. And so mm -hmm. the, the drug, you know, follows this so-called thunder road from thinking about the effect <laughs> on <laughs> uh, the effect on cognitive function to being approved on the basis of amyloid, which again wasn't even in discussion at the advisory committee. Well, and that's see what how has... many Bruce Springsteen references we can work in here during the next hour. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, if it isn't Bruce Springsteen, it'll be John Le Carre novels because, or some other story of sort of uh, what just happened and who knew what when. Pick your uh, espionage and or whatever uh, stories, because I think that that that's event number one. When I went to bed on the evening of June 6, the idea of reducing amyloid as a surrogate measure, the way we reduce LDL with a drug, was a provocative hypothesis in need of further testing. By the evening of June 7th, it was clinical practice, and that was not because of a breakthrough study. It was because of this imperious decision by the FDA. And as Aaron points out, the, the way they dismissed that topic in November and never reconvened the advisory board or any discussion of this regulatory approach and uh, uh, is blow number one of several blows against the reputation of the FDA and has raised real concerns about the process that the FDA engaged in. And accusations, for example, that, you know, 
well, claims by, say, Alfred Sandrock at Biogen, the head of research and development, you know, that science proceeds in public discussion and debate. I totally agree with Dr. Sandrock, but there was no public discussion or debate of the particular approval that was given. That's exactly what Aaron said. And I think that it raises real concerns about what FDA's decisions are, their decision making, and casts a real pall on this particular decision as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, Jason is referring to an article that just came out today from Biogen um, saying that there's a lot of misinformation out there um, and misunderstanding. And that's not how scientific debate should work, which is also interesting, I find, because how many phase three animated control trials have been published to date? Of aducanumab? Of aducanumab? None. Uh, so that's usually how I think about scientific discussion is is actually through this traditional route. And we still don't have a publication. Aaron, I'm going to turn to you. How common is it that a the FDA advisory committee universally, unanimously said basically no to this and that basically FDA goes down this different path without actually involving an advisory committee moving forward? Yeah, but the, I think the, the sort of um, statistics say that the FDA, the FDA doesn't have to agree with this advisory committee. And I think the FDA doesn't agree with its advisory committee, maybe about uh, 20, 25 percent of the time. But mm. usually when the FDA doesn't agree with the advisory committee, it actually is in the direction of uh, putting more restrictions than the advisory committee recommends. And it hmm. and and this was the completely other direction. And it also usually isn't disagreeing with a unanimous advisory committee. So I do think that those two considerations, those two, uh, the fact that it was unanimous and the fact that the FDA uh, approved the drug you know, over the over the recommendation of it were make make this a, a relatively uh, unique decision. And you know, since then, and I think that actually, you know, there were there were other, you know, what about go, what about Aaron then going and using a different set of regulations too. Yeah, and so the, the other the other major issue is this idea that it switched the premise on which it was approving yeah. the drug from thinking about the effect on cognitive function to mm -hmm. the the impact on on amyloid at the at the eleventh hour. That is also relatively uh, relatively unheard of, and and I think that uh, one of the one of the more unique things also about the advisory committee itself is you know I've been to a, a, sorry half a dozen or so of them as a member of the advisory committee since twenty fifteen. Usually there's some kind of controversy where the FDA says, well, we think this and the company says, well, we think this. And you can see where the points of difference were. Um, you can, you know, at this advisory committee, the FDA and the company came in almost sort of, you know, in, in line with each other. And they both said, look, we think this drug should be approved. What, you know, don't you think it should be approved advisory committee? And, as, and I think the advisory committee pushed back against that and said, no, actually, we don't think that there is convincing evidence. And that's the that, so that, that I think that that dynamic um, was also uh, was also questionable and 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 um, and you know since then there's been some reporting about uh, about you know off the record off off the books meetings between the FDA and the company that occurred before the advisory committee they, maybe they were you know doing a little bit of dancing in the dark so to speak you know so uh, so I don't number two <laughs> I don't really uh, so you know I think all of these things are important parts of the process that it, that deserve further investigation. Yeah, I mean, just to add to Aaron's point, um, uh, number, you know, Billy Dunn says to Aaron and his colleagues on November, you know, the discussion of amyloid as a surrogate has not, is off the table, not a topic. You can find that in the transcript. I have an essay in Nature uh, Reviews Neurology where we quote page and verse. Um, but it turns out actually in June of, of 2020, conversations between FDA and Biogen were on just that topic. And number two, when Aaron and his colleagues heard the presentation in November, which he's described, the FDA's statistician, um, Tristan Mazzi, had issued a detailed report critical of the st standard approval, and there was never a discussion of that report, minimal discussion of that report. Tristan himself certainly never presented. Moreover, moreover, since the decision, FDA has issued memos that describe uh, real-time memos prior to the decision the internal dis discussions, and in addition, Pam Bellick in the New York Times earlier this week published a more detailed uh, investigation. And it turns out FDA was deeply divided that some in FDA wanted standard approval, others opposed standard and accelerated, and still others viewed accelerated approval uh, as a sort of compromise in some sense. So you had three different competing opinions in there. And then to add to the intrigue, um, the need for congressional hearings, quite frankly, the need for the Office of Inspector General. Janet Woodcock, the acting commissioner, 
essentially, as best as I can tell, says I was not really following this. I was uh -huh. busy with Operation Warp Speed and other things. And my response to that, if I was in the Senate or the House, would be Alzheimer's is one of the top killers, prevalent disease, costly, arguably sort of the, the COVID of long-term care. And you were not at all apprised of this decision that you that would be earth shattering. I, I, you know, I, I have to say, at least she at least dropped the ball on this one. But anyway, I don't want to make it about Janet Woodcock. The process that has unfolded at FDA has multiple moments where it just raises real questions of the question, what's going on at FDA? So um, maybe we can talk about that. But before we do, maybe we can just actually talk about the data. Um, so we, we mentioned that this drug, Aduhelm, aducanumab, removes amyloid. So they're using a surrogate marker. We're saying it does that well. Should amyloid be a, a surrogate marker for clinical benefit? No. Why not? Because the data that describe uh, the reduction of amyloid and, and its relationship to clinical uh, uh, course are still a work in progress, both when done in experiments like Adahelm and other drugs, uh, uh, number one, and number two, amyloid accumulation occurs up to 10 years prior to symptomatic onset. By the time symptoms are occurring, amyloid accumulation essentially has peaked out. And so the idea that reduction of an alteration in amyloid is like the CD4 count, if you will, of HIV, reduce it, the patient does better, or LDL, pick your, it, you start to sort of leap across metaphors or stories that just don't hold up anymore. Yeah. The missing actor in all this is another biomarker, namely tau, and we can talk more about that. Aaron, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the essential question is that, you know, when the, the drug was approved as being uh, under accelerated approval on the theory that the reduction in in, uh, in amyloid plaque was reasonably likely to translate into clinical benefit. And I, and I think that that fundamentally the issue is, is there a reasonable likelihood that that's going to that that's going to happen? And I think that the the there is a lot of debate right now and not a lot of clarity about what changing amyloid does and what the point yeah. of it uh, has. Like, you know, there's been a, a long history of drugs that have targeted amyloid. Now, you know, some of those drugs haven't removed it as well as aducanumab does. Some of those, those, but, but, you know, the history of drugs targeting amyloid has led to a lot of drugs that don't change cognitive function and some drugs even make cognitive function worse. Maybe it's the case that aducanumab is totally different from that history. Um, but I think that the, in, it is incumbent on Biogen to demonstrate that in a yeah. clinical trial, or at least provide some suggestion that that's the case, you know, in the in the results that we have from the uh, from the aducanumab studies, which, by the way, were you know, as Jason said, were, were um, closed on futility after you know 18 months or so of therapy, uh, but uh, in a lot of patients in there, there doesn't appear to be that uh, that kind of effect where you see a a clear relationship between. Uh, changes in in um, amyloid plaque and and effect on on uh, on cognitive function for which there was none uh, in those in in you know in the in the trials when you when you pull the trials together. So and I find it's a little bit of a double talk when I hear FDA or Biogen talk about it. They say you you got to ignore all of those past fail amyloid anti amyloid studies because they didn't work like this drug. But hey, we have you know. Lots of evidence that amyloid actually, you know, is a reasonable surrogate marker based on past studies. So, like, which, which one is it? Yeah, they're sort of robbing a scientific Peter to pay Paul. Um, it's a brilliant disguise, so to speak. Indeed. <laughs> um, you so, you know, I, I think without getting too too in the weeds here with the, with the science, but I think, you know, I mean, let's do that. Yeah, you know. If you look at folks with particularly MCI, and 75% of the subjects of the uh, Engage and Emerge study had mild cognitive impairment. So inefficiency. Engage and Emerge, those were the two phase, phase three, three randomized study. controlled trials that were stopped right. early based on a futility analysis. Right. Right? Okay. And then, re and then reanalyze when more data came in, one popped out, that would be in Emerge and Engage remain negative. And only in the high dose group. 75% of the subjects had MCI, if inefficiencies in cognition, and all had to have elevated amyloid. If you look at individuals with mild cognitive impairment, my colleague David Walk um, has published this recently, and there are other data in the literature. MCI, elevated amyloid, trivial to no tau, they are very stable 
people over time, minimal change in cognition, minimal transition to mild stage dementia. It's only when you put tau in the mix and start to show uh, tau uh, scan measures that are, uh, correspond to Brock stage three spread of tau pathology in the temporal lobe that you start to see change over time in these individuals. And indeed, the latest sets of studies now have made an emphasis on you have to have elevated amyloid and evidence of tau spread in order to get the drug to be tested. And indeed, many of us thought that the next study that should be done with aducanumab was just that. They didn't have tau tracer available when they started the studies years, a couple of years ago, engage and emerge. And only later did they add tau tracer. And so you'll see this data that they put out where they have like 15 subjects who had tau scans in the, in the phase three trials, and they report data out from that. You know, 15 subjects with tau scans you know, you could use those their their first names for a, a wordless learning task to test whether they per- transition to dementia. My, my my point being, you know, th- it just wasn't a study that was designed in the way that I think now we think these studies need to be designed to establish: do these drugs make a difference, or do we need to move on to a different mechanism? And I think that makes the field so furious. And I will say, and then I'll I'll I'll, con- I'll take a drink of tea. The <laughs> I can't, amongst the crowd in the Alzheimer's field that I hang out with, I I have not been able to find folks other than those who are in the sort of clinical trial world have been very public even before approval, who view this approval as the breakthrough. Most of them just slap their foreheads and say, I can't believe this happened. Many of them won't speak about it because, you know, politics, et cetera. But I will say people who I deeply respect and are just shake their heads and say this was a bridge too far too soon. And they are really angry about what's happened. Uh, mm-hmm. These are people who are we- uh, well-respected trialists, mm-hmm. folks in the drug discovery world, folks at Alzheimer's centers. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, a bridge too far too soon is the way you might want to describe this one. I'm jumping to film metaphors mm-hmm. there. <laughs> Okay, what about the argument that you need a first in class before you have a best in class drug? So you need to get this that like dog first drug out there before you get drugs <laughs> that actually work. Because that's what I hear from I, I haven't heard one person say this is a breakthrough. Even the people who are supporters, like I've listened to a lot, like Dr. Soloway is another like nobody's saying this is an amazing drug that is just going to have huge clinical impact. It's all, you know, eh, maybe it works a little bit. But so you need that sorry, first drug gotta, out there. That's what the Alzheimer's Association is saying. Yeah, this is this innovation. And in Sandrock's letter to the field to tell us all to behave, the head of research and development of Biogen, Alfred Sandrock, his letter to the world today, his closing point is that this will spur innovation. And he is absolutely correct. Um, It has already spurred a host of uh, VC, venture capital, and others coming forward with various ways to test amyloid, right? But that's that's a business argument. That is not a scientific argument, quote, spurring innovation. And the Congress, to its credit, has been pouring money into Alzheimer's research. You know, um, the, the, we are getting our grants funded. We are getting our research done in the space. We did not need the approval of this drug to pump us as a stimulus package for Biogen and other uh, uh, VC firms to, co- to continue our research. And I, to, I find that innovation argument a business argument that is not a scientific argument. It is not a public health argument. And I reject it as part of the discussion as to justify the approval of this drug as, as a, a, for therapeutic. All right, Aaron, yeah. go into you. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. No, I mean, I feel like, I feel like that's, I feel like that's right. I, I, I think that the, the argument isn't about how well the drug works because um, it might be if, you know, it, it, the drug doesn't appear, if it doesn't appear to, to have much effect. And I think the issue is, that the drug doesn't work at all. Like there isn't good evidence right now that the drug works. It might work, it, who knows, but we don't really, we don't know. And that's not, that's not the basis on which we approve drugs. We approve drugs when there is uh, some, some, some evidence, some convincing evidence that the drug works. Um, and right now we don't have that. And, and I think that the innovation, I think the innovation argument is a good one. There is, you know, there were, um, there's a whole bunch of other drugs that, that reduce uh, amyloid and um, most of them were now going to go into larger clinical trials to try to test what effect that drug would have on actual cognitive function. And now those trials won't happen. That these drugs are now, you know, Eli yeah. Lilly has indicated that they're just going to bring those drugs to the market. And, and that's this not is actually innovation. That's 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 hurting innovation because now we we won't actually know what these drugs actually do. Well, if you take innovation as venture capital view of innovation, it's beautiful. I mean, the, the money is flowing, and I've heard that crowd and those who surround them. Uh, you know, clucking that this is revolutionary. But I complete Aaron's point, let me reiterate, because it's so important. 
So in May of 2020, in the New England Journal of Medicine, investigators uh, 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 reported the results of an Eli Lilly-sponsored study of a drug called Donanumab. There were provocative data on uh, an anti-amyloid drug, Donanumab, in individuals with tau and amyloid, remember what I said earlier, that there may be a signal here going on clinically. The abstract of the article in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2021 concludes further study is needed to validate these clinical findings. In June of 2021, less than a month and a half later, Eli Lilly says, we're going to go ahead and look for approval. And I can't fault a company for doing that because their regulator has said, I'm lowering the evidentiary bar. And, you know, from, from the perspective of a board of directors and shareholders, it's like, well, sure, go for it. At, but from the perspective of public health and patient care and science, I, you know, that's yeah. throwing away evidentiary standards. Yeah. And so this is a real problem. This is not just about aducanumab now. Well, can I, I want to go back to November, Aaron. Uh, you're in this FDA uh, you know, advisory committee. You're being presented basically the data from Biogen and FDA saying, hey, this drug is great. Don't look at the pooled analysis because you can't pool these two identical studies look at Emerge, and hey, we're seeing this clinical benefit on the high-dose group. And we should look at this plus the Phase 1B study. How convincing was it? Like, was this a clear, you know, absolutely no, like, come on. What, like, what was going through your head when you, that you were seeing this data? I sh- Maybe I would say I was on fire. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I, no, I, I Jason think that, was going to get that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, I mean, I think that the, you know, basically the idea that we should only focus on the one positive trial and not focus on the identically designed trial that was negative, um, is not really the, you know, the sort of right way to think about the, the evidence. And so you have two trials, the two trials were identically designed. Um, you know, and and they were pooled, and when they were pooled together, that they were found to be futile. When they were then subsequently reanalyzed separately, they found this signal in in the arm of one, in the high dose arm in one of the trials. And I, I think that given it, it's it's impossible to evaluate that study without also looking at the other study and 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 the the negative study, where in fact the placebo patients. Uh, did better than the aducanumab patients, although the result wasn't statistically was although that result wasn't statistically significant. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that that like the idea that well, let's you know discount the negative trial and let's only focus on the positive trial just isn't the way that you're supposed to an- analyze studies. And I think that the people on this on the advisory committee said, you know, as a, as a group, I think each of us came to this conclusion, you know, individually because we're all you know separate individuals that came to this and you know didn't talk about it ahead of time said that doesn't that's not that doesn't make sense that if you if you're going to approve a drug you need some um something that you can uh look to and be confident in that 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 the drug actually works and and we don't have that we have two conflicting studies and what we need is we need more research to try to figure out if this drug actually works or not there are so many things we could talk about i want to make sure that we get to a, a couple of topics uh, one is pricing, you know, $56,000 a year plus the cost of scans monitoring, right? This is going to potentially break Medicare if they approve it. We had a meeting, uh, part of the California Technology Assessment Forum, which is a division of the Institute for Clinical Effectiveness Research run by Steve Pearson. They met last week. I'm normally on the panel. I wasn't because I was on vacation and also because I sang a song that many of our listeners are familiar with about aducanumab. <laughs> and Steve Pearson, the director, called me and said, I don't know if you can be an impartial member after you sang <laughs> that song about aducanumab. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they voted 15 to 0 that the evidence that um, aducanumab plus supportive care is superior to supportive care alone was not there, right? Like, it just... It's not there. Uh, yeah. And then the, the value is not there. And the pricing, if anything, should be like just a, you know, less than $10,000. And here it is priced at $56,000. How did that happen? How can a poor man stand such times and live? Well, uh, I would say that this is truly a story that is born in the USA because uh, we allow drug companies in the US to charge whatever price they want for drugs. And we are alone in the industrialized world in doing that. In, in most places uh, around the industrialized world, they have a process called health technology assessment after a drug is approved, in which they evaluate 
um, the, the, the value, the, the clinical benefits that the drug offers, and then they go through a process of negotiating a price, uh, a fair price, um, with the with the manufacturer. And for drugs that offer a lot of value, that price might still be quite high, but for drugs that, that don't offer any value, um, the, the, the drug is usually priced at the level of comparable drugs or, or at the, the level that the clinical benefits that it offers. And so since we don't have that in this country, and since uh, you know, that allows Biogen to declare uh, any price that it wants for the drug. And that's why, you know, that's the situation that we have, uh, you know, a drug that, and then of course, um, you know, we have to talk about coverage of the of that price by insurers. And there are some insurers, um, you know, like Medicaid, um, certain drugs in Medicare, where um, we automatically cover every FDA approved drug at the, you know, at its price or at a, you know, sort of a, a price with a, with a guaranteed discount on it. And so, we have this situation in the U.S. that is alone in the world, where once a drug gets FDA approval, a drug company announces its price. Um, you know that price is then uh, that drug is then uh, then becomes available. Now, um, you know, Aaron, can in, I ask you a quick question? Case, yeah. How much is the bio? How much is Biogen's hands a little bit tied? Because this is an infusion. It's an infusion that a we don't even works and has side effects. So if you're trying to get con- physicians to prescribe it. You can't use evidence, but maybe like incentives, for example, you know, getting additional money to infuse this drug in your clinic and this additional money that they get per infusion. How much? Because they wouldn't make a lot if there was, you know, priced at $1,000 a year, but at $56,000 a year, a physician actually may make a decent income prescribing or giving this drug or an infusion center would. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that's an important issue too. Is the the, the conflicts that uh, that or the, the conflicts of interest that it puts some physicians into? Because the way that we reimburse infusion drugs is we through Medicare is that we give uh, physicians a percentage of the cost of the drug to in, infuse the pro, to infuse the product. I, I think this just goes back to our you know drug payment system where we don't really have um, you know a lot of uh, rules or regulations that. Uh, ensure that drugs are priced fairly that are, and are priced in line with the benefits that, yeah. they, that they provide. And let me, two points. It is a biologic and biologics are expensive to make. But again, let's just have an open conversation about how costly this thing is to make. The, the uh, by the way, also a dog may start barking any minute now. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, other, the other point I want to build on what Aaron just said this drug, because it's an infusion, is actually prescribed not under uh, reimbursed not under Part D, but under Part B. And under Part B, it means you're, as Aaron points out, providers get a percent of the total cost. Mm-hmm. Now it's six percent, but it's actually I just got educated that it's more like about four percent. So, so the point is that there's a dark irony here of this drug, namely it fulfills back to sort of only in America or you know, uh, uh, etc. It it fulfills one of the dark ironies of the American healthcare system, which is if a disease doesn't have a business model, it can't fully be seen as a disease, namely diagnosed and treated. And Alzheimer's has been haunted by that. And by a business model, what I mean is a healthcare system has to at least break even on diagnosis and care, or at least make a little money. And if you can break even or at least make a little money, especially if it's a big common disease, you can diagnose and treat patients. If you can't, you struggle. And that's been the case, certainly, for Alzheimer's, as I think all of us as clinicians know. Certainly, I can say it at our memory center. We live off of cross subsidies from research and philanthropy. Well, you're right. I mean, the sad irony here is this $56,000 a year with a 4% pay, uh, profit um, stands to be in a, 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 a wacky stimulus package for the care of patients with Alzheimer's. And, you know, I don't find that at all appetizing. I find that to be an indictment of our system. Uh, you know, even even the most you know clear critics of this decision will ruefully admit that this will actually be a win-win for the memory centers because it will start to pro- bring funds in to pay for what we've always wanted to do. Well, but well, let's that- let's yeah, let's talk about that because Jason, you are the director of the Penn Memory Center. Yeah. We have Mount Sinai. We have Cleveland Clinic saying they are not going to administer this drugs. Um, I think Sinai said yes. Yeah, they, okay. they have, yeah they Sinai have. is waiting tell for the us, Office of Inspector Jason, General. What, tell us, Jason, what's going to be going on on the streets of Philadelphia? <laughs> there you go. Well, actually, actually we're, we're, if you go to the corner of 12th and Market, we're, uh, we're selling it for a discount to score, um, scoring if you can score for a discount. So, you know, uh, my colleagues and I uh, very much allow each of us as providers to make the decisions we want to make to practice medicine we want to make. 
Having said that, we've not arrived at any collective decision different than uh, uh, what we decided a few weeks ago, which is let's get the system going to make this drug available. And, you know, from the perspective of a memory center, um, this is a choice. It's out there. The system has produced it. I have to have some faith and trust in the system. And, you know, for this particular disease, a disease of autonomy, you know, I have to do everything I can to respect my patient's autonomy. And if after learning about the uncertainties of the benefit, frankly, the potential I won't use the S word, but the, the the damaging events that led to the approval, et cetera. If someone still wants to take the drug who's within the eligibility criteria, I'm a reluctant prescriber. But, you know, I, I kind of view p- folks who come to the memory center as a, as a kind of person that are looking for things. So, so how would they, they get a paid for? Reluctant prescriber. We will they... see what their we will see what their insurance will cover. I mean, that's yeah. part of the missing calculus here. And Aaron, uh, which um, is, you know, when a prescription is handed in, will it be reimbursed? And when we're thinking about CMS, what do we know right now about whether or not Medicare will cover this? Or in what do they have any options for for limiting the use of this drug? Or are we just they're in it for the fifty to one hundred billion dollars that it's going to cost? Right. So Medicare Part B usually covers all FDA approved drugs and they cover about 80 percent of the cost and leaves 20 percent of the cost to patients, some of whom have their own insurance pro- program, some of whom might qualify for um, you know, Medicaid or other um, or other subsidies to cover that that cost, some of whom are going to have to pay for that out of pocket. But the 80 percent of that is going to come out of Medicare Part B or tax dollars. Um, the Medicare has a process called a national coverage determination in which they can uh, evaluate their coverage criteria. They usually don't use those coverage determinations for drugs. They usually use them for surgeries or expensive uh, procedures, Um, but they have announced that they are going to apply this national coverage determination process to aducanumab to determine what they're gonna do with it. And so, you know, nine months from now, we'll get a decision. They may say, for example, that they're going to require a, you know, uh, an attestation of a, you know, diagnosis of Alzheimer's, of early Alzheimer's disease, as opposed to, you know, later stages. They might require um, a PET scan or some other um, imaging modality to guarantee that the patient has amyloid plaque. So they might put restrictions on, or, or some restrictions on who could get the product. But I think it's very unlikely that Medicare is going to not cover the drug. Um, and then we're going to be left with this question, and I think this is one area where Jason and I differ. I, I don't think that I would uh, recommend, I would not recommend the drug outside of a clinical trial right now uh, for a patient who came to my primary care clinic because, you know, I don't think that there is uh, good evidence that the drug works. And I think that there are concerns about the drug safety and concerns about the financial uh, considerations that, that a patient will have to go through. And, you know, maybe it's better for that patient to consider uh, you know, other supportive care or other uh, other ways that they can that they can use their their funds. Yeah, you know, supportive care. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Uh, Chris Langston, who is the um, president CEO of Archstone Foundation, which funds Jerry Powell. Full disclosure. In addition to Biogen. Oh no, sorry, <laughs> not Biogen. But um, uh, he wrote a blog post saying that uh, you know. Th- they should mandate collaborative care. We have a history going back like, you know, decades showing that collaborative care, comprehensive dementia care, human touch centered care, let's call it, um, is really effective at, for outcomes related to patients, for outcomes related to caregivers in the setting of dementia. Um, can we mandate that in addition to, um, aducanumab, that we that uh, there must be payment for supportive collaborative care services for all people who are prescribed this. Eric, you want to jump? Yeah, in? and I think the addition it's it's if you're going to be infusing this, you also have to offer the that kind of it can't just be the infusion it has to be associated with. Well, so so here's the dark irony, as I was saying, which is folks will say, well, now that the the, the revenue we're going to get here is going to finally pay for the services we need what Chris Langston says should have been there, and I agree with him, you know, before aducanumab, um, because of course we need to have staff who can help monitor for the side effects. Uh, we need to be able to have the time to educate the patient and family about the risks of the drug, the need potentially for APOE testing. We need to maybe help them uh, have access via transportation to come in for the scans, et cetera. A- again, I'm not saying any of this like with great celebratory rhetoric, I'm saying, the dark irony here is that the revenue from the drug is viewed as a way to finally staff up memory centers to deliver the care that we know, as you have said, Alex Smith, works. To even just add to the anger I sometimes feel over this, um, alternating with regret and, and whatnot, 
or sometimes you just got to laugh, is um, the National Academy of, of Sciences issued a report, uh, full disclosure, I was on the committee looking at collaborative care models and concluding that the evidence was good enough to get them out there, though further research was needed for, for to support, quote, their wide dissemination. Hmm. And the, the shocking thing is the quality of the evidence supporting them if was far better than the quality of the evidence that got FDA approval for aducanumab. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and yet we were of course using a standard that required for wide dissemination. And you got to yeah. if, if you don't cry you're going to if you don't laugh you're going to cry, excuse me. You know, when you see, you know, within the same calendar, you know, 12 month period a, a proven things that well we you know it's good but we need more evidence and then this drug is out there and everyone's all happy because it's going to cost fifty six thousand dollars a year and the venture capital is going to flow etc and it is just all about business you know and janet yeah. woodcock said there's a more powerful force out there than medicare yeah. she said and that's the marketplace and she said that she's on there's record saying, on the edge of town there it is <laughs> Well, um, I, I could continue on this discussion um, we go, we go like, for forever, but real quick. So lightning, <laughs> you guys lightning had a round. magic wand. You can make one change, one thing that happens from here going forward. What what would you do with that magic wand? It could be like around uh, the inquiries around this. It could be about CMS, but you can only have one thing. Uh, Jason, what's your one thing? Oh, I struggle because do I want to go specific to this or the more general problem? But I'm going to be the co-director of the Memory Center here. Uh, reverse the decision and call for the rapid execution of a confirmatory phase three trial uh, with design features to finally establish does this drug actually clinical course of the disease. Oh, good use, Aaron. Yeah, that 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 uh, that sounds like a great. Uh, I, I I support that uh, idea. If we were going to, if we had, truly had a magic wand. Um, since we don't, I mean, I think that the best we can hope for uh, is that the investigations will, uh, you know, uncover ways that we can try to change, you know, make sure that that problematic processes and decisions like this, uh, you know, are are uh, are restrained. Because, you know, I do. I think that the the FDA is an incredibly important public health agency. It makes the right decision most yeah. of the time and makes a lot of important decisions. And so it's really important that we figure out when there are these kinds of problematic decisions, what happened so that uh, it doesn't affect the trust that people have in other decisions that the FDA makes and that we can try to you know, make, make better decisions in, in similar circumstances in the future. So maybe go uh, back to yeah. the glory days of the FDA. That's right, waiting on a sunny day. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Hey, Alex, before we go through all the spring teen songs, do you want to give us a little bit more Barn to Run? Wendy, let me in. I want to be your friend. I want to guard your dreams and visions. Just wrap your legs around these velvet rims and strap your hands across my engines. Together we could break this trap. We'll run till we drop. Baby, we'll never go back. Whoa, will you walk with me out on the wire? Cause baby, I'm just a scared and lonely rider. But I gotta find out how it feels. I wanna know if love is wild, babe. I wanna know if love is real. Jason, Aaron, big thank you for joining us for this podcast. Thank you guys for doing this. It's really important, and I really appreciate you giving us the time. Thanks a lot. It's been a lot of fun. And thank you for uh, actually putting yourself out there and being vocal about uh, your thoughts on yeah. this drug, the FDA, and everything else. I really encourage all of our listeners. CMS is open for comments right now on Aducanumab, Aduhome. We'll have a link to that on our show notes too, but I really encourage you to make your voice heard if you feel passionate either way about this drug uh, because others are uh, and they generally have a lot more money than us. Thank you to all our listeners. Thank you, Archstone Foundation, for your continued support. Good night, everybody. Good night.